So, hi everyone. Um, uh, glad to be here to talk to you today about remote workflows. So, my name is Gonzalo. I do Android and product at Doist. Um, I will be live tweeting some key takeaways from this talk, and you can also access the slides at that URL. So, this talk will target two core audiences uh, people working remotely and companies trying to implement remote work. Uh, so, there will be two parts. So remote work is a hot topic right now. It's uh, what everyone's been talking about, but it's very far from being consensual. So uh, people have a hard time agreeing on whether it's beneficial or not, although they tend to think it is. Uh, but there are many different views on it. So who here knows Todoist? So did you also know that it was built by a fully remote team? So that same team is building something new called Twist, and it's a tool about asynchronous communication. I'll get back to that later. But in sum, we embrace remote completely, and we've done so for half a decade now. Uh, this map is actually outdated. It was taken when we were, uh, I think, around 30. We're about 50 now. And so there are more locations where we are around the world. So basically, we are a fully bootstrapped remote company uh, with people from all over the world. And I won't focus on the company itself. I've done that in a, in a few past talks. What I'll do is try to distill the, all the years of experience uh, and mistakes that we have doing remote work and you know, bring out lessons from, those, uh, uh, from that experience. So the first part of the talk it's about uh, working remotely. So does any of you work, has worked, or is considering working remotely? OK, OK. So I know, <laughs> it seems like I know the audience. OK, let's start with individuals. So we all know that remote work is great. I mean, there are many great things about remote work. The, the number one thing I would say is that there is no commute. So for example, Commute is highly correlated with happiness levels. So there is a slight correlation between how long a commute of a person is and how happy they are. If you are working remotely, most likely you have almost no commute. Of course, you get to work on your time. And this can mean that you are a 20-something and you're a night owl and you like to work in the evening because you work less hours and you do the same work. This can also mean that you are a family person and you want to spend time with your kids in the afternoon and do some work in the morning and some more at night. So you get all this flexibility for free uh, to you know, mold your work to your life and not the other way around. You also get to work on your place. So if you're a fan of the quiet office and you have a spare bedroom and you have a, your office in there, you can do that. If you like noisy places, such as working from a cafe, you can do that. It's totally up to you. Another cool thing about remote work is since, then, since micromanagement is really hard to implement while working remotely, because people cannot be staring over your shoulder all day, you tend to have more ownership and be able to have more initiative in this scenario. So if you like to take initiative, take risks, you probably have a better chance of doing it in a remote setting. And one, one other point is that you get to work with a bunch of extraordinary people. So you basically work with people from all over the world, people with radically different uh, cultures and experiences from you. Uh, they were not born in the same place. They have not lived the same politics and the same social contexts. So these different lifestyles actually provide a, a very different experience that you can learn from. It's a huge opportunity for learning and growing with them. And of course, you get to travel. If that's your thing, you can pretty much travel all over the world while making money, which is kind of a big deal. For example, at Doist, we have a couple of young French people who have been in Portugal. They are now living in, in um, Bali. They will soon go to Thailand. So they're just traveling and working remotely. However, remote work is not a silver bullet. It's not all roses, you know. It can be hard, and it is hard in a few scenarios. So let's see some common problems that remote work usually 
uh, shows. So the first one is that you need to be really good at communication. Communication is important uh, in all companies, but I would argue that in remote companies, it's even more critical. Most of your workflow will be around communication, written communication specifically. Uh, and since there's no micromanagement and people can't watch you work all day, you actually need to be very effective when you're talking about what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how you plan to do it. You need to communicate, and you need to do it effectively. So the first thing you can do to improve your communication skills is reading. Read blog posts, read books. I mean, read whatever you want you're likely not communicating in your mother tongue, and you could use the experience with the, this different tongue, probably English. The second thing, again, if it's your thing, is that you can write. If you try to write blog posts, if you try to maintain like, uh, this professional Twitter account of yours, uh, you will tend to get better at it. And this will reflect in your daily work. And you should make it a habit. So you should make it a habit to read, to write, to, you know, to be learning the language, to watching shows, I don't know, listening to music, paying attention to the ly ly lyrics. In some, trying to improve your, your skills around the language in which you have to communicate. So the second point where remote work can be hard is that in most companies, in most teams all over the world, people work synchronously. So you get in in the morning. You do some work, um, you finish your MVP, you go up to your designer, you show it up, and this person will tell you if they like it. If they don't, they will ask you to make some changes. There's a very synchronous workflow, which does not work at all in remote. So it needs kind of a, like a, a, a paradigm shift from you. Uh, so the first thing you can do to uh, be very comfortable with the asynchronicity is that you should multitask. So it's very healthy to keep a secondary task or a third task that you can do if you get blocked in any of the others. So if you finish your MVP and you send it over to your designer, but it's 2 AM somewhere all over across the globe, you can just continue working on your secondary task while you wait for feedback from them. You should also master the ability to disconnect. So this is something that affects a lot of uh, people, especially developers, which is kind of my base area, which is we have a hard time when we are working on something on switching context to another. Uh, but this is something that you can train and that you should train, because it gets better over time. So very related with asynchronicity are time zones. So time zones can be a problem. Um, basically. The number one advice for dealing with time zones is to be reasonable. So maybe having a meeting at 6 PM sounds like crap to you, but maybe your friends that has to wake up at 8 AM to meet you at 6 PM, for them, it's much more reasonable. So you shouldn't really force them to get up at 6 to meet with you at a better time. Then uh, this is going to be controversial. So if you read about remote work, especially online, people will tout work-life balance as the best part of remote work. I would argue it's the hardest part of remote work. Um, it's easy to mix the two and get into this um, lifestyle that really is not healthy for you. Just because you could be working doesn't mean you should. So the number one thing that can help you with this is setting a schedule. Now, of course. You're working remotely. You don't want a fixed schedule. That's not what the, the hype is all about. So your schedule should be flexible, but you should have one and try to stick to it. Um, you should also like, not work from your bed, from your couch, in your pajamas. So make an effort to get dressed and you know, put on some pants and try to create a work environment so that your mind resets to a work state. And then you can revert that when you're done working. Another thing that helps a lot is planning your days. I mean, obviously, I'm one of the people building Todoist, so I suggest that people have task lists. And why does this help? It helps because you can list all the stuff that you have to do for the day. And if you realize that you won't be able to do it, you can manually move stuff to the next day. So psychologically, it's like, OK, it's not lost. I'm not late. It's just rescheduled. You know, It helps. You should also take breaks seriously. When I started working remotely, it would be common for me to have breakfast at my computer, to think, oh, I'll just have lunch on my computer and leave 30 minutes, like stop working 30 minutes earlier. Uh, 
this actually is terrible for focus, focusing because like breaks are a critical part of focus. So if you take an hour long pause for lunch, it actually helps your brain focus in the afternoon better and stuff like that. Another thing that most people struggle with with remote work is that weekends are off. So you should be resting, you should be doing other stuff, you should be resetting. Of course, again, your schedule should be flexible. So this is one of the cool perks about remote work. If you need the Monday off, you can take it and then work on a Saturday. But the point being, you should take two days off of every week. And basically, work can wait. There are many, many more important things in life than work. Uh, and if you're not supposed to be working, then don't be working. Disable notifications, try to use platforms that allow you to set a work schedule and not get notified. Uh, because I know that it's hard to be on the couch watching TV late at night and someone posts a message on your communication tool. And maybe it's just five minutes to respond, but then comes another. And then you're being sucked in into this loop when you really shouldn't. Work can wait. So finally, one thing that will suffer if you do nothing about it is your social life. Um, there are many things you can do to tackle this. Most of them are pretty obvious, but I feel that it's, if you make a conscious effort, you improve your odds of tackling it properly. So if that's your thing, you can work from a nearby co-working space. Uh, you can give it a try. Maybe that's not your thing. It's not my thing, for sure. Uh, but it can help help you with your social balance and also your work-life balance because you have a separate location for working. So one thing I highly recommend is having lunch with friends. Once a week, maybe every two days, like take a group of friends that have lunch near you and go out to meet them, um, socialize. The, second, the third thing is like going out. So when you're working in a regular company, this is something that comes very ad hoc. Maybe at the weekend you're feeling tired, you don't want to go out, I mean. But when you're working remotely, I suggest that you try to make an effort to like every week, every other week at best, go out and exercise your social skills. Because if you stay for too long at home, isolated, these things will suffer and they will, you know, slowly make you miserable. Don't isolate yourself. And the fourth thing is that we tend to think that we are robots and that we have friends in real life and coworkers at work and we don't really care about them and sometimes we don't even want to deal with them on a personal level. But the thing is, there's real people behind the screen and in a remote setting, they're from all over the world, they are really interesting people and, you know, be nice. Ask about their weekend on, the mo on Monday. Uh, try to go to the same conferences. Visit them when you travel. So if you go to a country where some other colleague lives, you know, grab a lunch with them. Know them personally. So remote work is part of our future, and we should generally be ready for it. Why would most companies keep limiting their hiring pools to 10 million or 100 million when there's 7 billion people in the world, more than 7 billion people? Uh, mentalities change and many will follow this path. Not all of them, but many will do. It's important that you can leverage the great things about remote work while being ready for the things that are hard. So, on to the second part of this talk. So far I've talked only about individuals and the things that are great or hard about remote work, but now I'll focus more on what companies or teams or should be doing to enable remote work, or things that, you know, if you have a boss, maybe it's something you can discuss with them. When you're building a remote team or a remote company, there are certain things you need to enhance and certain things you need to employ that are new. So, the first thing is that you need to hire smartly. So, you need independent people more than anything, because there's no hand-holding, there's no micromanagement, there's no next desk colleague. So you need people that are able to look at the work they have to do and do it. Um, you need people that are really good at communication. And this is not about communicating a lot. It's about communicating frequently and effectively. Uh, basically, communication can be well done, but it can also be overdone. So you need to find a good balance. The third point is a word that I hate, but I can't find a better word is passionate. You need people that take risks and that try to get out of the box and do stuff. 
and uh, because these risks, sometimes they will fail, sometimes they will pan out, but the more important thing is that passionate people inspire the others around them. And you need a few of these in your team, in your company, because they are kind of a glue of inspiration. And of course, you need to watch out for cultural fit. So I won't dwell too much into this, because I, f I feel like this is a, a, a point that's highly opinion-based. But when you're growing a remote team or company, you need to pay very close attention to your company culture and how you can maintain it. Because over time, with more and more people, it's very easy to, you know, for it to fade away if you're not careful. Try to find people that match the people you have or that match the people that you want to have and move on from there. So one of the cool things about this slide is that you not only need to hire smartly, you can also train your people. So you can, for example, uh, pay them an English course if you communicate in English. That will improve their communication. You can reward initiative, even when it doesn't really pan out, um, and etc. There's things you can do to improve your existing people in these areas. So you hired smartly. Now you need to onboard. So these are some of the things that work really well for us. And the first is that you should have a trial period. In our case, it's around three to six months, and during this period, this person is adapting not only to the company, not only to our products, but also to remote work. Many of the people we hire did not do remote before, and they're learning. Uh, we also usually dedicate a mentor, and this is something I suggest everyone does, because it really helps. So it does, this doesn't mean that you get a person to spend all of their day with the new guy or the new girl, no. This basically just means that a person is available for them. Um, and they try to help them and have like a small conversation every day about how things are going, what difficulties they are facing, uh, and, and so on. And very, very importantly, in all companies, actually not only remote, but again, in remote certain things to take a, a more, a bigger role, is that you need to have constant feedback. Since many people have never done remote before, they can fail at pretty basic things on it. And if you're not honest, if you don't tell them right up front, like, hey, you could be doing this better or you're doing this wrong, they will probably not know that they are doing poorly. And when, then when you get fed up and you fire them, this will come as a surprise for them. So you can totally avoid this if you provide feedback early and often, and people will tend to try to improve. So you hire people, you onboarded them, and now you basically have to take care of them. So universal rule, we're in Portugal, so we kind of have this problem in general, but you should really pay fairly. This means paying a salary that makes sense to people, but also means paying attention to their uh, context. So if you hire someone from Porto and you hire someone from London, I mean, this is controversial, but their cost of living will be very, very different. And it does not really make sense in general to try to uh, match their salaries like on a universal scale. I know some people do this, but it really didn't work for us. And we obviously had to adjust you know, for fairness. Another thing that uh, is pretty, pretty cool is that you have uh, perks uh, for your team or for your company. Perks that make sense, perks that you can afford. So for example, uh, maybe you could send people to conferences once or twice a year and just you know, lightly suggest that they try to coordinate and go together. You're killing multiple birds with one stone by doing this. Another thing, if you have a remote company, is that you should probably be sponsoring your workers' internet connections. Because like, maybe ADSL is cheaper, but you don't want you know, meetings with, where the video is pausing all the time, where everyone is wasting time. You want people to be on solid, reliable connections so that when these synchronous interactions come, uh, they take only the time that they really need. You should, of course, although you work remotely, you should respect people's vacations, sick days, parental leave, etc. Uh, this is something, especially around parental leave and sick days, that falls flat in many remote companies, but we can do better than this, and we should do better than this. This is, again, a generic thing. It applies to remote as well. So you let people do meaningful work with modern technology, so don't try, you know, if you put people doing boring work with old technology, they will exactly get bored after some time. And 
<clears throat> this is something that Steve Jobs would not approve, but it's something we've been using from day one, and it's one of our biggest pride points. Uh, so again, I suggest that you try this. We have this concept of the best idea wins. And what this basically means is that discussions take place in the open. So while not everyone is invited to discuss, otherwise it's a huge mess, people can intervene if they feel like. So if the design team is having a discussion about this design within themselves, but this is being done in the open, nothing prevents an iOS developer from coming up and saying, hey guys, I have a small suggestion, which is this. And many, many times this will be an awesome suggestion that others had not thought before, and things move forward. It also, this open nature also helps preventing isolation uh, from you know, working remotely. That sometimes you might feel isolated, but if the discussions uh, take place in the open, you kind of get to know what's going on. So you've done all of these things to your people, and now you should really let them shine. So you, know, you need to trust them. And this, in remote work, I can't say how important this is. So one of the things that really works in an office is, is you know, people see you working. So they see you on your computer writing code or making designs or whatever you do, and they feel like you're working. You're working. So we, our culture is not really optimized toward results. It's optimized towards time. So you should be working eight hours a day on your work programs or whatever you use. And this is a really bad measure, and it doesn't really work in remote. So you need to trust people. Maybe you don't know what they've been doing for the past three or four days. But again, you hired really great people. You onboarded them properly. So now trust them, and they, more often than not, will deliver. You should also trust that they have their time and their place. So maybe you're a morning person. Maybe you get up at 5 in the morning every day, and you really, really feel like this is the best system for everyone. Well, it might not be. Maybe your colleague that's a night owl and likes to work at night, uh, that's more productive for them. And you know, respect them and accept that everyone is different and that they're just taking advantage of remote work. You should also promote initiative, initiative and creativity for the reasons I've said before. This goes two ways. So you want people that are able to do this, and you should also promote and reward it. Another cool thing that you can do is that you, you can give plenty of ownership. And this helps feeling people that are working remotely more as part of a single purpose machine. Uh, what this means is let people take risks and let them uh, try new things. And if they succeed, give them, you know, let them reap the, rewar the rewards. And very, very important, and the last point about this, is that you need great leaders. So generally, when companies start growing a little bit larger, you, need, you, know, you have team leads, maybe technical leads, maybe uh, whatever structure you use, you're going to need leaders. And these per people will have responsibility around other people. And you really, really need to be careful to have enablers. So the typical boss that goes around desks every day to see what people are doing, this doesn't work. You need per people that remove barriers from others, that try to help others in all this remote work, not only your company's work, and not only the technical work, but also the remote work workflow. You need enablers, basically. So working remotely is something that Another difference from normal work, I mentioned this before, is that it needs to be always asynchronous. You should plan asynchronously, you should discuss asynchronously, you should work asynchronously, you should optimize everything to be asynchronous. And that's why you need tools that are asynchronous. If you remember in the beginning of this talk, I mentioned a new communication tool called Twist. This was a huge pain point for us. We were using synchronous communication tools, namely Slack. And when we have 50 people in like 20 time zones, it really doesn't scale. So find tools that work asynchronously for you. Well, it can't always be asynchronous. Sometimes it needs to be synchronous. Uh, you'll probably have a few meetings. So try to schedule them in advance in a considerate way so that it doesn't screw up anyone's plans in their time zone. And also, you know. It's kind of healthy to have a random cheat chat in the company. So what music are people listening to? What shows are they watching? What do they recommend? And find a place where people can do this that does not induce FOMO on them. You know. 
So let's talk a little bit about meetings. So everyone hates meetings. I hate meetings. So let's kill useless meetings and let's kill useless time off of meetings. In a re remote setting, I feel like people tend even more to try to dominate meetings, especially extrovert people like myself. But still, you should have a regimen. So I will recommend that you meet weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly. Although these meetings serve very different purposes. So you should meet weekly to basically do the usual, you know, talk about last week's work, plan this week's work, uh, talk about problems, and make a, a week plan inside your, each team. You should meet monthly so that um, you, could, you should do one-on-ones with people and have a more personal meeting, like, what are their frustrations, what are their ambitions, uh, how they've been feeling lately, so that, you know, basically your CEO or your team leads, whatever, are connected, more connected to their employees. Meeting quarterly is something that we've been experimenting with and it's kind of cool. We call it informal hangouts and we basically join eight to ten random people from the company in a hangout to talk about silly stuff. So make a five slide presentation about a hobby or talk about your pets or whatever. We keep changing subjects, but it's just like a bonding mechanism. And if you can afford it, uh, maybe you could meet yearly. So this is expensive because it implies that you fly everyone to the same location for a few days every year. Uh, if you're already thinking about the money, I suggest that you think about the money you're saving by not having an office for all those people. You can probably apply just a tiny portion of it to this trip. And although you can obviously go to fancy places, this year we went to Iceland, you can also go to cheaper places. Last year we went to Menorca in Spain and it was rather economical. And the last big topic about enabling remote work in your company your team, or your team is that you need to have an explicit vision and an explicit plan for it. So many companies, especially traditional companies, will have the global vision very hidden. So the bosses know what they're doing, but most people are just given tasks to do. Well, this kind of sucks. So you should have a vision, a five to 10 year vision that is publicly available, discussable, and that you iterate like on a regular basis. You should also have a roadmap, a six month to one year roadmap uh, that again, you iterate, you make it pub publicly visible. But please note that when I say publicly visible, I don't mean to the outside world, just inside the company, like have your CEO every month share the public roadmap, the changes that were done to it so that everyone is basically in sync. We've also been experimenting with the OKRs. OKR means objectives and key results. I think this was invented by Intel and then adopted and popular popularized by Google which basically you list three to five objectives, a few metrics to measure these objectives, like lower the crash rate to 0.1%, whatever, and you make them for the quarter. So the company in general has an OKR, each team inside the company has an OKR to work towards the company OKR, and now we do a slight variation of this that I kind of recommend because OKRs are overwhelming, which is in traditional OKRs, each individual also has an OKR. And the modification we've done is that individuals don't have OKRs. The team OKRs have responsible people for each metric or objective. Um, this keeps it much more readable for everyone. Like, it actually, because if you have OKRs for every single person and team, basically, many people will not do them or do them late. No one is going to read them. And it's basically a big mess. And the last thing is that Try to have demos about every month. So have your designers and developers demo the work they've been doing uh, to the others in the company to prevent situations where marketing, since they work in a different continent, they really don't know how your product is evolving and working. Show it to them. Create a process where they can be shown how it works so that your business people can sell your product better uh, by knowing exactly how it works and how it is being built. So create a habit around this demos thing. So again, if you have a company, if you are managing it, a remote team, uh, if you have a boss that's uh, you know, not really getting with the program, <clears throat> it's important that you realize what's really great and what's poor about remote work, not only as an indiv individual, but also as a, a company owner or a team leader or whatever. 
uh, you need to watch out for certain things and not fall into traditional habits such as micromanagement because it just doesn't work. You need other different processes. Uh, so I won't go all unicorn on you and say, you know, in 30 years all companies will be remote. No. Remote work will be a thing. It's getting to be a larger and larger thing as years go by and will, it will keep increasing, but there will always be traditional work. Um, however, it will be a thing, and the sooner people are ready for it, the better. You have many companies, such as uh, Duist, uh, Buffer, uh, Basecamp, that are kind of leading the way uh, in this regard at the moment. So thank you for coming. I hope you've learned a thing or two. Uh, again, slides are available at that link. And I'll take some questions now. Great presentation. Um, I have a concrete question. I'm assuming you work from Lisbon or from Portugal. Uh, what was the bureaucratic process that you went through? Uh, I mean, finances, uh, you issue recibos verdes. How do you do that? Oh, OK. The legal fiscal yeah. process. <clears throat> so basically, uh, for the vast majority of people, we have uh, an international work contract. We call it, it it's not, this is not the main, I'm not a business person, I know how things are uh, processed, but please forgive my you know, technical mistakes. So we have this international contract, which is actually a contract with a uh, US company, and people just issue uh, receipts from their country. So in my case, yes, it's a recibo verde, I have signed this contract. Uh, and I do uh, these recibos verdes every every month, basically. Um, regarding communication, if you have co-located people communicating with other co-located people, do you still use tools to communicate? What tools do you use for communication between groups? So basically, the question. I don't know if you all heard. It's it's. You heard it? OK. So the question is, if uh, when we have co-located people, so people in the same location, if we still use the tools like Twist to communicate or not, right? Yeah, we do. So in the beginning, uh, we made some mistakes around this, because we had uh, like a slightly larger concentration of people in Porto. And sometimes we would basically not be mindful enough of others. and to, make decisions uh, literally in a co-working office that we had, like the, the four or five people that were in Porto. Now, this has yielded poor results because we've made poor decisions. We've made some people, I mean, rightfully pissed off. And we had to make some adjustments. And uh, so my response is yes. Currently, all of our communication goes through a medium where other people can observe and follow up. This is very, very important to avoid others feeling isolated. And this includes video and audio meetings as well? Video? And audio meetings? Yeah, we do video and audio meetings. So most of the meetings I mentioned before, the weekly, monthly, etc., uh, they are uh, video conferences. Uh, although we do like to discuss in text, because text lets you, you know, think about things thoroughly, explain your opinion, challenge yourself, you know. And working remotely also means that most often than not, you can take a full day or two days to reply to something. And this really helps getting your thoughts in order, you know. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you plan asynchronously. Yeah. So, 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 it's, so you sort of facilitate your planning in a way in which people get some prompts, they write to somewhere, and then you aggregate it? Like, can you go into more detail on how you plan this synchronously? Like, instead of like going to a meeting and just deciding things? So, uh, there are many layers to this. We have meetings around planning. Again, the weekly, the week plan is usually done in a meeting. But there is like this overall plan, you know? What will we be doing next? Not, like, after these features, what will, will there be next? So we have this plan, and more often than not, this plan is discussed in the open. Like, the team lead will come up and say, hey guys, so I've been thinking, we have these things to do, we have to prioritize, I was thinking about these, what do you think? And people will come in and say, hey, so maybe we should, you know, add this, bump the priority on this because of, you know, this partnership or this 
release of a new device, whatever, you know? So this discussion happens in the open, people intervene, and when people are happy, they kind of freeze it. So nothing is ever really frozen, but uh, they say, okay, we, we're gonna commit to this, and they move on. So we do this asynchronously in the sense that it's not, basically, if it's Monday, you shouldn't expect to have Monday morning. You shouldn't expect to have your plan for the next month ready by a Monday afternoon, no. You need to allow people time to think about things, uh, discuss, so it's, it's very, like I would say that 24 hours is the absolute minimum you should have on any decision in a remote setting. And most of them should actually take longer to let people you know, reflect about them. Okay, guys, <clears throat> let's eat. <laughs>